Um, now we're going to look and share some work that has been happening across the network over the last few years. Um, first up, I would like to invite Anna McCurry um, to speak about taking Gaelic further in museums. Anna is working with Applecross Museum, Gearlock Museum, West Highland Museum and Highland Museum of Childhood. Um, and so I'm really excited to hear about her work just now. Um, we're going to be quite strict with the times today, so we have 10 minutes and then we'll open the floor to just a couple of questions. Helen is our timekeeper today. Yeah, I'll be timekeeper. I'm quite strict because those of you that are coming for the evening meal and the film, we have got a evening schedule, so I will timekeep for everyone. I'm going to to um, my name is Anna McCauley, I'm good in Gaelic, and I'm the Gaelic Museums Development Officer, as Nicola has said, working with four independent museums across the Highlands. And I'm really pleased to be here just to talk about the work today. We only started this project in January, so it's a very kind of brief introduction to where we are and what we've been doing. So I'm working with these museums um, to further how they use Gaelic in their work and with the communities that they serve. It's collaborative work, finding commonalities between museums, whilst being flexible enough, both myself and my colleagues, eh, to suit each museum's different circumstances. And I should say I'm really pleased that there, I've got representatives from each of the museums that I'm working with here in the, under their own eh, steam eh, to be in tone as well, which is great. Working with Gaelic in this way is a new undertaking for the museums, eh, and I think it's a really exciting one. Each museum is in a different place in their relationship with Gaelic and how they may or may not have used it. Some having used it to a good degree already in displays and outreach and engagement work. Others less so, but with an acknowledgement for there being a need to do something. The project will give, well one of the, our aims and objectives is that the project will give museums greater confidence and understanding in working with Gaelic itself and Gaelic related material, whether collections, oral histories, whatever it might be. My job specifically is to provide Gaelic specific expertise and that means guiding, informing, connecting, advocating for and most importantly of all I think, listening to what each museum needs and wants. So they've all come into this project with something of an idea of where we want to go and it's about forming and shaping that. My own museum background as a, a curator primarily means that the work can be rooted in collections and in interpretation but also in an audience engagement and in research as well. Those combination of qualities that give museums their kind of very specific importance. The project also has an element of strategic linking and planning um, alongside the practical work of getting your hands dirty. That idea of the strategic thinking um, leads on to this quote at the top from the Abacross Historical Society's Gaelic policy. So they have a policy which sets out their position about Gaelic. Which broadly translates as we can't ever really understand our heritage and our history without knowing about Gaelic. I think that's quite a clear, strong statement for an organisation to make about how important they view Gaelic to be to their site. I know there might be some of you here who don't know anything about Gaelic, so <laughs> in the briefest of histories, Gaelic is one of Scotland's national languages. It's an indigenous language and culture, and I believe, as I hope many of you will too, that it's fundamental to understand it, the history and heritage of the Highlands, like this statement from Across says. If you're not a speaker yourself, or a learner, or whether you're hearing Gaelic in your local shop or community space or not, chances are there's a Gaelic medium school or unit not too far from you, raising new generations of speakers. And it's a guarantee the language is visible in the landscape 
place names and topography of your local area, whether the language was there many centuries ago or if it's very much still in the community. It's important for Gaels of all backgrounds and ages to have the chance to engage in their culture and heritage through their own language, not having to only uh, be able to engage with it through English. It's important that visitors to the Highlands too, of course always an important part of this conversation, can experience Gaelic language, culture and heritage through the perspectives and voices of Gaels themselves. We have our own world view as Gaels, it's a distinct thing, and I believe that that's something which deserves to be treated with respect, integrity and proactive inclusion. And it's those principles which are underpinning how we go about working on this project. But I want to also talk about what we're actually doing in each museum as well. How are we um, in Gerald Museum, we're, um, there's already quite a lot of Gaelic for your uh, visitor going around. They're seeing it, they're hearing it. It's an object labels and interpretation. But there's also a huge amount behind the scenes which hasn't really been kind of explored in any great depth. They're certainly not been made available to the public. There's a lot of material around local dialects, but also vernacular poetry, which is incredibly valuable and incredibly rich culturally as well as just of general interest, giving a sense of the place and its heritage as well. In Applecross, where I spent a great few days just last week in all weathers, so that's appropriate, um, it's very much focused here on the landscape, so that's the place names, the hill names, and how the language is very much visible in the landscape. It's also about how Gaelic cultural practices have formed the landscape around us. There's always that narrative of the highlands being remote and rural, and we all know that that is by and large nonsense. The, the hand of humans is visible everywhere, and much of this is, is born out of, uh, for much of the highlands, a, a Gaelic worldview, whether that is the kind of pre crofting landscape the story of crofting, agriculture, coastal life, all these sorts of things, and that's what we're exploring in, in Applecross. In the West Highland Museum, um, it's slightly different sort of collections there, but really wide-ranging, reflecting different aspects of, of Gaelic heritage. There's an incredibly important collection of objects there by the folklore and antiquarian Alexander Carmichael, luckily we feel, to Gaelic speakers, who some of you might know through the Carmina Gadelica. Um, a really important text, which is also just worth a read if you're interested. Um, these objects are deeply entwined with folklore and traditional customs and really capture a way of life in the Highlands which was just on the cusp of really being lost at the point at which these objects were collected. And there's also a very strong um, bardic history in this area as well, such as with Ian Long, who's normally walking stiff as in the middle there. So, there's similarities there to the other two museums, but also something quite different too. And finally, um, it's the Highland Museum of Childhood, just up the road in Strathpeffer. And we're taking a slightly different approach here. And that's really to... Uh, a different approach is needed because it's a different kind of collection to the other museums and it has a slightly broader geographical area as well. We're looking at how Gaelic has influenced our childhoods and, and how... Go to hills, but it's much more succinct than the drama. Um, we're exploring how Gaelic has influenced childhood and Highland upbringing. I think any of us who have been raised in the Highlands will know that you can see there's a certain Highland way of doing things or seeing things. We're trying to interrogate what that might actually mean. And what's interesting about working in Strath Pepper is that Gaelic is present in the surroundings, there's GME available in the local area, and such strong connection to other parts of the Highlands, but it's not a community language there anymore. So this influence of kind of a Gaelic upbringing, or where these roots and those influences are, sometimes isn't recognised. But the words, expressions, or ways of looking at the world that we teach and have taught our children, which are very Gaelic, are definitely present. So it's these sorts of ideas of experiences and how we use words without really thinking about it, where they come from, that we're going to be exploring this and how that impacts the kids. As well as some really fantastic objects, like you'll all know to see the doll. Um, she's got this fantastic story about which really reflects on changing land use and things as well, relationships between different people in the Highlands. <coughs> and also this fantastic um, swimsuit from North Uist, where Gaelic remains. It's very much a community language. So there's a lot of 
stories there, but I just want to say, first of all, Clef Dino Kaili. If we don't use Valak, we will lose it. I appreciate that it can seem confronting or daunting if you've never engaged with Gaelic before, as some of you might not have, but I would say don't be afraid. There isn't any time to lose as far as using Gaelic is concerned. We are in a precarious position. So, yeah, clacking up your kind of, there's another great Gaelic expression that says, the shy Gaelic is in a Gaelic speech, you're better broken Gaelic than Gaelic in a coffin. It doesn't rhyme in English, it doesn't sound quite so good. But it's that principle that give it a shot, try, because otherwise, <laughs> eh, otherwise you're not proactively helping. You might in fact be, be hindering, which is a hard thing to say, it's not a nice thing to say, but we are in a, in a difficult position to say. But I would also say that you don't know where to start, but you maybe want to, you want to think about what you might be doing. Speak to me, speak to my colleagues here. I know that I'm spotting faces now, but I know that there are <laughs> speakers in the audience. There is help out there. It might just be that you have to go and proactively find it. But just don't worry about it. Just try and, try and do something, whatever that might be. And for me, it's not just that it's a kind of a, a social issue. It's something that's kind of on my conscience. I think people should be doing it. But they're using another language and employing another worldview and perspective in your work can offer such riches and such value and give just a totally different sort of perspective to things that you might be doing. So it can really be a case of developing our own understanding and our own skill sets too, as well as just employing another language. And I know that for my colleagues, they, I hope they won't mind me say that for some of them, I know that this project has been a step into the unknown, but they're being bold and they're being brave with it, so hopefully there'll be lessons that we can learn from this over the next sort of year and a half and a bit, so it's a two-year project we should have started with. Um, so all credit to them, and like I say, I think it's a pretty good example that, a lot of, that many people could learn from a few, anyway. Hopefully this whistle stop tour gives you a feel for where we're going, and like I say, with the project only having started in January and having a long way to go yet, there's still lots to be done and lots more to come. And hopefully some of you will uh, find something of interest in the work that we're doing. Happily. that Anna was outlining there, if you could give any thoughts around that. You know, I think it is a very new approach for us <coughs> to collaborative work with MHH on a much bigger scale. So it's completely new for us to be venturing into a partnership of our own with another ski museums and Anna. Um, but it's really developing <coughs> our confidence and skills just working with that other four museums, the other three museums. And it's a bit like Dan said earlier on, it makes you feel like you actually have colleagues when you work alone in a museum, apart from your team <coughs> support. Um, but yeah, in Strathpeffer, it's a bit of a challenge for Anna because we are a little bit different to the other three museums. We don't have a lot of Gallic related objects in our collection. Um, but we have identified that Gallic is something that we see in everyday life through words like smashing or urin that are used in everyday occurrences that people don't realise that that comes from Gallic So we want to try and kind of dig deep and try and you know, help people locally realise that Gallic is still part of our communities because, yes, yeah, it's not very... Um, not, it's not um, spoken much in Strathpeffer, but there is Gallic Region Education locally, um, and I just don't think we do enough to recognise it and involve it, yeah. Thank you, Marvin. <coughs> it's good to just see you taking those first steps and being great, and it's great. Thank you for offering Anna uh, any support to anybody who is wanting to go on that first journey with Gallic. 
And is there any, any other questions? Time for them. <laughs> uh, next up we have Cross Project. Can I? Um, storytelling project conducted during the pandemic. Um, so I'll pass over to you to start. Yeah. Thank you. Um, yes. Sorry, thank you. Um, thanks for the chance to talk about the project today. Um, I'm Kelly Morrison and this is Dr Katie Murray and we work at um, University of Highlands and Islands in the Centre for Tourism Research. And we're just going to talk to you briefly today about our project Coast that Shaped the World. It's a long title but it's been pumped on as Coast. Um, just <coughs> yeah, sorry. Um, so just the, yeah, the usual project, uh, mentioning the funders, the main funder for the project was Nature Scott, through the Cultural and Natural, Natural and Cultural Heritage Fund, um, which was a, a European ERDF fund. And um, we also had match funders from Wootai West Highland and CalMac. Um, and the project really um, combined tourism and heritage. Sorry, um, so the overall purpose was essentially to try and bring people to the lesser visited parts of the west coast of Scotland, that was the focus area for the project, through the mechanism of community stories, um, stories from people within their own communities, and it was linking the theme years of the Year of Coast and Waters, and last year's Year of Scotland Stories, when the, the main project outputs were launched, which we'll, we'll cover shortly. Um, so as well as working with the, well, the funders, um, we also worked with a team who supported us at UHI, so we had um, a number of experts on our web and app development, so our exhibitions, and helping with the, the project gathering as well, the story gathering. And a huge team really, because the main part of the project, the main ethos of all, was to have story gatherers, so people from within their communities across the West Coast. Uh, we have 32 people, all their um, great faces there, um, collecting stories from within their communities in a variety of ways. Unfortunately, obviously, due to the pandemic, it was not as face-to-face -face as we hoped. So it had to be done in quite creative ways. Um, because of that as well, we also had to do part of it online. Um, and also just to say that the galleries were quite a diverse range of people. Some had museums and heritage backgrounds, some worked, worked within local heritage centres. But they all brought something quite different to the project. Um, yes, yeah, so and we also we set up a project microsite um, to collect stories because of the pandemic. So we had a mechanism for people to submit online through a long. We started off with a longer survey. The microsite and the survey were both in English and Gaelic, and then we shortened we shortened the survey because it's probably a bit too complicated. So. We, yeah, we simplified things and that resulted in more stories being submitted. Um, and we also had a series of workshops, which again we'd hoped to have in person, but they were online. So we had 12 um, covering themes and regions that were part of the project. Um, and we also, yeah, we, we, because of being online, we had people attending from all around the world. So it was kind of a silver lining of it having to be online. So the culmination of all of the, the ways we gathered the stories um, was a huge amount of stories, which was, was brilliant. We had about 1,300 in total from all those methods of gathering, so we had a huge task to, to sort, um, select, and curate the stories. So I'll hand over to Katie, who's going to talk you through that now. Yeah, we decided our story gathering efforts had been far too successful, because with 1,300 stories, Trying to cut it down to about 400. Uh, at UHI, we spent the next 
four or five months deep in spreadsheets like this one that'll get ever more complicated with ever more layers of colour coding. So we assessed each story against some criteria, trying to get a widespread of themes, trying to get a good geographical spread, and then went about the work of making the stories ready for publication. And of course, most people in the room will know what that means. It means getting permissions from the contributors, doing supplementary research, writing up the stories, finding suitable images, etc. Uh, during this time, we were working with the gatherers again to use their local knowledge. We were coming back to some of the museums and heritage centres that had helped contribute the stories in the first place to get more information, to find extra resource. A huge learning from this. I think we, we decided during this phase that at first our net had been cast too wide. We were asking people to contribute stories in whichever way they wanted to, whereas we were at our most successful when we created quite a tight template to capture exactly the kind of information that we needed to transfer into publication. Sorry, thank you, difficulties. Down. <laughs> Thanks. Um, so I think what we ended up with, uh, a bit more visually pleasing, this is a typical story as published on the website with a bit of text, uh, an image where we could find one, and crucially, where relevant, a bit more information about where people could find out more. These stories were only ever intended to be an introduction to a particular subject, so uh, maybe a book, maybe a website, maybe a local museum or heritage centre where people could find out more. Um, and all these were published on a website that we hope you'll check out maybe this evening following this talk. They were all organised by theme and by tag so that people could access the stories that were going to be most interesting to them most quickly. They were also mapped and we think this is really maybe the USP of this project. All the stories were mapped in as close to a geographical location as seemed relevant or interesting so that people could be standing on site. And it's linking back to the tourism aspect of this project. It was meant to be taking people to under-visited areas off the beaten track. And we also produced an app which had all this same content but which was really designed for people to be using while they were out and about and actually exploring the west coast and islands of Scotland. Quite nicely on the app, and this doesn't appear on the website, there's also an audio section. So we got about 40 of the stories recorded by professional storytellers so that people could be standing on site and actually listening to the stories. And maybe most relevant for this room, a series of exhibitions. We had four exhibitions, all themed, based around different themes, touring the west coast of Scotland last year. Hopefully some of you saw at least one of them. They were touring around different museums and Calmac ferry terminals. They were designed to be quite portable and easy to move, and in fact, it wasn't quite as easy. We had a few logistical difficulties trying to move these exhibitions. And we have um, a social media campaign, of course. So please follow us on social media, like us on social media. We publish stories periodically. If you find a story you particularly like through the website or app that you think your own followers would be interested in, uh, please get in touch with us because we can create a social media post that you can then share or reshare if there's anything that's particularly interesting to you. So what's next? Um, we're entering the final few months of the project. It's been going on for about three and a half years now. Kelly's been involved all that time. Um, and now we're entering our final two months. So it's really all about promoting what we already have. We, uh, those exhibitions, we're in the process of dismantling them. We're taking all the individual story panels off and we're offering them back to their host communities. So finding the most relevant museum or heritage centre and seeing effectively if they want 
these story panels. So what we're hoping is that we get a little series of very tiny coast expeditions spread throughout the Highlands and Islands, which would be quite nice and really fit in with the original ethos of this project. Thank you. Um, yeah, also just I suppose to say we did get two extensions on the project, um, partly due to COVID initially, and then also just to give us some more time until the end of June this year to be able to do these kind of outreach things and keep promoting the resources. And I think that's been really, really great to have that chance because I think so many, you know, once it was launched, I suppose you know quite a lot of projects kind of end at that stage, which we originally were going to have to do. But yeah, this has really been a great extra chance to, to do that. And the web and app resources will be staying live till 2030. So there's a good bit of legacy with the digital resources as well. Um, and also just to say that we are here for um, the rest of the, the conference. We've got a stand um, just, just there. Um, and we'll show you the, the website and the app. And we also, there's a virtual exhibition as well that shows you what the, the panels were like when they were on display. So yeah, we've got a good few resources to show you some of the story cards. Too. So yeah, please do come and chat to us, um, and yeah, and hopefully collaborate in any ways as well. Thank you. Uh, just before you sit down, anyone got any questions for um, for, the, for the host team? Uh, as as I said, they are, they'll be here for the next for the rest of the conference. But if you want to ask a question, Dan. Yeah, uh, how successful is the project been in getting people to visit the underrepresented communities that you have Well, I suppose, sorry. I suppose that's always the, the, the interesting part of it. And I, we're in the process at the moment of starting to gather some data on that. We, do, we will be kept in post a bit longer after the project technically ends as well to get as much data and positive and quantitative feedback as possible. So, We've got bits of information that, you know, we have had some positive responses so far. We can ch check the app downloads. We've got QR codes in various places. Um, and trying to just get as much detailed feedback as possible. So it's slightly time will tell still, but definitely what we've heard so far has been positive. And I think even just people being able to learn about these places, even if they're not going to go initially, you know, that it might entice them to plan holidays there and, and plan to visit in the future. So... Yeah, a kind of mixed bag at the moment, but we'll hopefully have a good evaluation by the end of this year to give more data on that. That's great. Thanks. Yeah, that kind of leg is that time to have that assessment and evaluation yeah. of the legacy and how successful the projects have been. I think we all recognise that often projects end and then there isn't the funding to kind of yeah, support that time to evaluate and actually gather the statistics. Any other questions from anyone? Okay. Um, how did you uh, identify and communicate, communicate with the communities across the West Coast at the beginning of the project? So the, um, the project kind of emerged from an initial collaboration was called the West Coast Marine Tourism Collaboration. So it was actually the tourism DMOs who kind of drove for trying to have a project that gathered more of the heritage stories to add to the kind of marine and tourism data that they already had. So as part of the project, we, we did actually have a contractor to, to help manage some of the story gathering section because it was an enormous task, as you'd imagine, and even just employing the, the 32 community gatherers. So we did have a consistent contact who we knew quite a lot of um, people. We also did obviously put out posters. So it was trying to, we tried to identify people who would have good connections within communities, but also maybe not this, the people everyone always goes to as well really wanted to try and uncover some other hidden gems or stories from different perspectives. So, yeah, they, they probably managed most of that with our brief, but, um, yeah, it was just, we did have a few changeovers as well during the period of the project, naturally, because it covered a few years, but, um, yeah, I think we had a good diverse crowd, and, yeah, about a third of the gatherers also were Gaelic speakers, so that was really helpful to try and engage with those communities as well. So. Hats off to you doing that during COVID as well, and um, so moving from all the plans that I imagine you initially had to be face to face to having to go as we all did yeah. online. So, yeah. Okay. Anyone else? Any other questions? Okay, we're going to hand over now to Rachel Thomas from the Museum. Hi, Rachel. Um, so I, 
I'm presenting on behalf of Gallup Museum, and I feel like a bit of a fraud because I haven't actually been involved in this. I will do my best to answer your questions, though. So this project that I'll be talking about is uh, Warm Winter Wednesdays. Now, Gallup Museum has always been uh, within the heart of the community, and this project was... Um, we were hoping it was going to encourage um, a diverse range of participants, many of whom were not actually normally museum goers. And the overall aim of the project was helping people to connect and break down the barriers between participants. So Gellar Parish, for those of you who don't know, is a small group of scattered rural villages. But before COVID, it had a really active and well-connected um, community of groups. So we had um, arts groups, music groups, sports clubs, um, people of all ages, and there was also college classes for people with learning difficulties. But along came COVID, um, we had a lot of people shielding. Lots of the clubs and activities were closed down, but I think most importantly, there was a real sense of isolation for some of the people in these more rural communities. I know it was common across the highlands. Um, many of our groups closed, not all of them restarted, and we found that lots of people were hesitant to return, and lots of people didn't return to lots of their groups beforehand. Um, quite a lot of the stories we were hearing, again, common across, I think, the whole of the Highlands. People were struggling to reconnect, um, people were struggling with their confidence and having lost confidence over the months, and people wanting to rebuild relationships. And also, we were hearing lots of people really struggling to access technology, and some people really felt as though they actually hadn't connected online at all. So all of this showed us that our community was really wanting face-to-face -face activities in a safe environment. So we've always been pretty good at collaborating, um, and for this one we worked with two other organisations. The first is GAMS, which is the Girl Up Aid and Mobility Support, and the second was the uh, West Island UHI. The project was funded through the Highland Mental Health and Wellbeing Fund and GAMS. So the first step for this project was just to talk to people and see what they were looking for, um, and also to try and work out some activities that were group activities that people felt safe doing. Um, the idea was that people could come in, meet new people that maybe they hadn't seen before, they could do something like a craft, do a board game, and just to get to know each other. So these turned into weekly events every Wednesday uh, throughout autumn and winter. So we have a cafe in the museum, um, and they served hot drinks and homemade cakes, and then also there was a free lunch um, with a soup and a scone for everyone as well. And we actually found that food was a really good um, way of breaking down barriers and getting people to talk. Um, as well as this, there were arts and craft sessions, time to read the paper, to chat with friends, and a place for carers to relax too. So we felt as though we really needed to make sure that the environment people were coming into was comfortable. So it was autumn and winter, the space was warm, we had a virtual log fire and a virtual fireplace, um, and then fairy lights and a Christmas tree. But also it was a place where people found to ease. So again, these were people that didn't necessarily know each other, so we wanted them to come in feel like they could engage in conversation and they, you know, they felt like they were happy to chat and they relax within the space. We also wanted everyone to be included and that was everyone in the community. So all of the arts and crafts activities that were planned uh, were meant to be for a range of abilities. So for example, people with limited dexterity, we made sure that we had scissors that were good for people with arthritis, um, board games with big lettering, uh, dice with big numbers and big dots. And we also encouraged people to come along with their carers or come along with a, a friend or family member who could support them. We advertised the group as inclusive, accessible and dementia friendly. So we made sure that we had enough museum volunteers to kind of help people walk around and move around the building and also help with the activities as they needed. And we're really lucky the new museum is accessible friendly, so we've got a lift upstairs. Um, but we also made sure that we offered transport for those in the, the rural communities that didn't, couldn't get in themselves. So the group was really successful and grew in size week by week. And what was really positive is lots of people were getting to know each other and, for example, sitting next to people they didn't know. So we were seeing people kind of move away from their usual social circles. And we put in place loads of museum volunteers to make sure that everyone was supported. But actually, as the weeks went on, the group was supporting themselves and we found to say that museum volunteers weren't needed as much because the group had become the support group system themselves. Uh, we had a really good collaboration from UHI, so they were able to offer a computer clinic for those who'd been struggling with their technology. And we also made contact with a regional dementia link worker, so a quote from her. She said, the people I supported really enjoyed the day. They relaxed, chatted and made connections. I'm hoping to come again next week, 
build confidence, and I'm hoping that Wednesdays will be the favourite day of the week for all of us. And as I said earlier, the, the group kind of became its own little culture. Um, so people bought in cakes, they ended up clearing up after everyone, and um, they cleared up after the crafts, as you can see here. The museum volunteers themselves became more confident working with people with dementia and uh, people with learning difficulties. Quite a few of them have gone on to do um, dementia training, so actually as, as a museum we're now more accessible because of these activities. And we've seen that our participants have been looking out for each other, so if someone hasn't come, they've, they've made sure that so someone's rings them and make sure they're okay. Um, they've been offering lifts to one another, they've been making sure that those who are in isolation throughout the rest of the week are, are okay. Um, and there's a little anecdote here that they says that there was a, a, an adult with learning difficulties who was helping an adult with dementia to find numbers on the bingo card. So there was a real kind of group, group mentality. And in terms of, kind of statistics, we had people from across the community. So we had men and women, um, we had people in their 20s, the oldest was 94. We had a few um, homeschool children, a couple of young people who've got English sign language and wanting to improve their English. We have people living with dementia and people with disabilities, both physical and cognitive. So unfortunately, Warm Winter Wednesdays came to an end in March, but we've got funding um, to continue as a slightly different version of it. So we aim to build on the foundations we've created, continue bringing in more people from the community who are isolated, continue bringing in people who we think would benefit from this inclusive and supportive environment, and continue to try and make the museum a place in the community at the heart of the community. So something we'd like to do going forward is we want to continue that sense of group support and get people talking to each other. So we'd like people to tell their own stories. We want to, people to talk about who they are, where they've come from. We want people to understand each other's lives. And we also just want to make sure that we as museum staff are you know, giving our skills and our facilities to, to the people of our community. So the main focus of this is going to be reminiscence going forward. Um, so we know this has been proven um, to be good for people who are elderly or those with dementia. But it also would be a really good way of helping people to connect to one another and for ha helping us to learn about our community and our local history. And hopefully um, going forward this can inform some of our social media and it can um, inform some of our kind of web presence as well. And there's a real hope that we can get information and stories past older generations to younger generations by doing this. And we would like to continue with the creativity side of things because it's been really, really positive. So arts and crafts, music, um, cooking and recipe tasting, storytelling, and then using the museum collection too, so object handling um, and, and looking at museum objects for, for memories. So the staff, I can't say this for myself, but the, 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 the team are really enthusiastic about it. There's been some really, really conversations and everyone's really looking forward to taking this, taking this to a new place um, and they're hoping to continue the museum in the, the centre of the community and a place where people feel included, so safe and welcomed. That's me. as well, so if there are elderly people who need to go to the doctors or, or go to a social occasion, there is also a community support there. But it was mostly from volunteers for the museum and then later on it was members of the group who were offering the future. Anyone else? Any other questions? I know some of your museums at some of the work that you do is kind of on This new um, round of funding is about reminiscence, so I know the next three, there's one about toys, I think there's one about childhood games, sort of like um, schoolyard games, but hopefully um, I'd like, for example, when there's a couple of people who know local songs and some of these things spark them off, so yeah, we'd like to record them, 
Um, in terms of the collections, we have photographs that we're going to be having on a screen, kind of going around in the slideshow. We've got handling boxes, but then also we're going to bring out the collections onto tables, so they can't necessarily touch them, but they can see different bits of our collections that are usually in store. So hopefully going forward, it's going to be a lot more interactive with the collections, and hopefully that will in turn spark ideas and memories and stories that we can steal back for the collections, yeah. Thank you very much for the, for the uh, invitation um, and we were going to talk a little bit about uh, the reconstruction at um, Fort William which you can see an overhead of there um, and I, I suppose the first thing was you know, why, why would you consider such an undertaking? started to look at digital during the um, pandemic. When the museum was closed, we had no experience at all and no skills um, to put anything in place. We started attending the virtual worlds um, webinars that the University of St Andrews were putting on, um, being run by Alan and his team. Um, and we sort of gradually started delving into partnerships. We um, produced um, a digital gallery with the now 100 um, objects gallery for a centenary, which is online and reached by our website. But we were really looking for a totally immersive experience, and when we offered us the opportunity to have this experience in the museum, we sort of jumped at it because it's something that was beyond our reach, affordability wise, skill wise, and we really just needed the expertise of you and your team to help us to create this. Um, yeah, and it was, it, it, it's been a good experience. Um, Catherine Cassidy came up to the museum in 2021 and completely photographed all our archive of the Fort at Fort William in 1746. Um, and from that, Alan's team were able to produce um, this amazing experience for us, which has been proven really popular at the museum. Um, do you want to explain a bit about that? Well, I mean, it, just to say, it's been, been great working with the West Highland Museum. It's a, it's a fairly sad thing trying to do a digital reconstruction without uh, a museum or without a place for it to um, have, a, have a home. So it was great to do that um, that, that work with your with yourself. Um, and yeah, we, we also we it was great to have um, all the information and, and the, the history of the of the fort. And I think that there was also a a, um, a play that had been done that we were able to sort of stage in the stage in the reconstruction. So I, I suppose the, the next thing we were going to talk about was, you know, was how, how sort of authentic is, is the thing. Yeah, we was explaining, we used the um, archive at the museum, um, passed that on to the university. Um, it was the Lockhart Local History Society a few years before had researched all the papers, um, the original papers from the siege. So I first, first explained that we captured it in 1746, which is the time of the siege of Fort William. Um, so you can see images on the screen there. That's um, Maribor, which was the village outside of the fort, and it was um, built like that. So basically, if there was a siege, um, it could be burnt down, and the inhabitants could um, seek refuge. 
and the Jacobites then couldn't come in. So, and these are the ships in Lot Mini as well. So they've used technology for the existing landscape. There's nothing left of the original fort now. Um, so it leaves a lot to the imagination. Um, there's literally just ramparts and uh, an interpretation board down at the um, down. It's, 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 it's down by Morrison's. Um, so it was really good to see it. Yeah, I think the only thing that does remain is the archway, um, which is a Craig's burial ground in Fort William. The rest of it just doesn't exist, and it, it's just really good to sort of use the original plans. The team at the university, um, Perrin, I don't know what his surname. Which is Yeah, so it's daily ensured that the um, costumes that the, the soldiers that populate the fort are wearing, that they're completely accurate. Um, they also ensured that the costumes that the Jacobites are wearing, the villagers, that they are accurate for the time for the, the soldiers that were stationed in the fort and the Jacobites that would have been in the invading force up on the hill as well. Um, yeah. So it's to- totally authentic at the moment. There's a few landscape conditions at the moment that, that have been tweaked, so <laughs> but that's it. So. In, in fact, we, we have tweaked, if you look at this one here, you'll, you'll see that the river is, is different from what it is now. From what it is now. Uh, yeah. So we tried to um, co- correct that. There were some differences in the landscape between now and Yes. Um, and uh, I mean, we, we, with the reconstructions, we, we base the sort of landscape on on OS data, and so are able to do sort of forty kilometer size chunks, which means that we can get all of the um, uh, um, all, all of the hills in the background, and so on, provide a nice sort of context for it. So, um, how's it all turned out? Then? Um, yeah, so it's been really popular. Um, the St Andrews team came up in December to install it. December's, we're open all year, but December's a very quiet time of year for us. And we're really lucky that we managed to get national press and um, local press involved, and it immediately brought families into the museum. We're a free museum, so anyone can come in free um, and enjoy the collections, but we're, we're finding particularly that people coming in, especially locals who don't always engage with that collections, are coming in to um, specifically see the virtual reality. Um, Visit Scotland have been very proactive. They've played with it themselves and we're finding that visitors that wouldn't normally come to the museum from out with the area, they're coming in specifically to see the virtual reality, but while they're there, they're engaging with the other collections as well and learning more about the history of the area. Um, it's been particularly popular with schools. Um, our learning officer is due to come join us a bit later. Um, she, she uses it for the Jacobite section um, and it's quite difficult getting the kids off of it again. We have, we have to time it. Um, yeah, it's, it's really popular. Um, and the school, local school children tested it back in August last year um, just to get some reaction from them. And again, the teachers were sort of from other schools schooling at them to sort of get off of it <laughs> and, and sort of, yeah. <laughs> but yeah, and we're finding now as well, we're getting busier with visitors to the area and we were a bit concerned that it might be an isolating experience for people having a virtual reality headset on, but because we've also in the gallery got a wide screen, whoever's wearing the headset um, can see, whoever's with them can see what's going on in, around them in 2D, so we're finding that families are interacting and showing each other how to use the exhibit, telling each other where to go once they're in the exhibit. Um, so yeah, it's, it's been a much more sort of engaging experience than we thought it would be. Um, and it's bringing audiences into the museum that wouldn't have come in before, both locals and out of area visitors as well. So we're, we're really pleased, we're really pleased with it. And the beauty of it is as well, because we're a volunteer-based organisation, and our volunteers are a little bit scared of it, as they are. They're scared of the till, they're scared of everything. Um, <laughs> but with, it's completely controlled by St Andrews remotely, so um, the only issues we've had with it have been, because we, we've been getting so many visitors using it, it's been over the and so we're having to get an extractor van to, to sort that out. <laughs> so, but yeah, we had about 400, 448 visitors in last week, I think, last week, uh, 
Um, and we're going to have to introduce sort of an etiquette as such so people can equally have a good go at, at it. Yeah. And, and um, you, you've been very patient as well with uh, the few hiccups that happened along along the way. So it's been, it's been a pleasure kind of working with, working with the West Highland Museum. And I, I think that it's, it's the hundredth anniversary, isn't it? Or was it something like last year? That's the last year. Um, so I think did you want to say something about the um, how are we doing for time. Wrap it up. Okay, wrap it up. <laughs> okay, well, but there's, there's a great online West Highland Museum 100 thing. Um, and just look out, there's this project that we're just starting called Digital Action on Climate Change with Heritage Environments, which is an EU project with partners um, in the northern periphery, so sort of Iceland, Norway, Sweden, and so on. Um, and we'll be lo looking to try and involve museums in the Highlands in, in that addressing climate change issues. And we, we have got the virtual reality headsets with, with us here today, so if you want to have a go, they'll be here tomorrow as well, I think. Yeah, yeah. then I'll do. Um, yeah, so do come across and have a go. And again, we've got the screen, so whoever's in the immersive 3D experience, I think you can watch what's going on. So far today, I think people might be goats and the chickens best. <laughs> Well, we, we tried to make it as, as accessible as we, as, as we could. Um, and so the, the first thing is, is that as when, when you come to the exhibit, there's a video that goes on a, on a loop. And so all you have to do is stand, stand by the exhibit, exhibit and, and to watch that, and you'll get to see the layout of the, of, of the fort. Um, and the uh, soldiers in it and, and so on. So in that sense, it, it, it's quite accessible. It doesn't require any computer skills to, to have that. Um, and then, you know, we, we've really tried to make it as easy to learn, you know, as possible. We, we're kind of using game technologies. And um, games, a lot, big part of the game is, is, of games is learning how to do the process. But we aim to have this to be essentially walk up and use, so you, that you can walk up, put the headset on, and with like a minute or two minutes of instructions or, or reading instructions, you can know what you can know what to do. So we've tried tried to do that. I mean, there's a visual side to it, and there's an audio audio side to it. So that's inside the museum. Um, but there's also a web version, so it is possible for um, people to see it. 
to, to see elements of the reconstruction from their home or from their classroom. But did you actually try and serve the people who got the restricted um, access? So you tried to out That, uh, the reason I'm asking is because we'd like to develop something that comes to courthouse and we're looking at ways of trying to make it as accessible as possible. And um, so I'm really curious about best methods for going about doing this. So I was sort of hoping you could tell me what, okay, we engage this number of people who do these sorts of tests. Um. Yeah, yeah. So, so this exhibit we had an op- we had an open day, um, and there were several hundred people used it on that on that o- on that open day. Um, I think that the, the we, we've been making sort of these sorts of VR exhibits for something like ten years now, um, and so over that over that period of time, we've refined what we do to make it as accessible as possible. And there have been a lot of people who have um, use these or this or similar exhibit that have um, you know issues with hearing or, or with or with sight. So I think that the you know the, the biggest challenge for using these sorts of technologies in in a, in a museum is to make it e- easy to use and is to make it accessible. So that's been one of the things that we've tried to and to make it reliable. Um, that they're, they're the things that we've tried to tried to do from you know moving from being able to do a sort of exhibit with somebody showing you what to do and holding people's hands and so on to something that we can just that will just happen in the museum day day in and day out that's quite a quite a shift but it, it's something that we've been sort of committed to to do it but I, I don't have a sort of 10 point guide to what you're asking and, and that probably is an oversight so we should probably Maybe we could um, put put something together along those lines. We could use your your experience in that area. Yeah, so we, we we did ha- there were evaluation forms completed, so people did have the opportunity. Or we were actively encouraging people to have the complete the evaluation forms. Um, so that was part of Catherine, Catherine's got yeah. research. I think. Yeah. yeah, and ease of use was part of, was part of that evaluation. Thank you. Are there any other questions? Thank you very much for the internet. That's a really fantastic final question, Liz. Um, as we think about embracing digital more, it's ensuring that it's as inclusive as accessible for as many of our different audiences who may have different challenges and um, how we want to interact with it to address those.